92.1 WROI, WROIFM.com. We are streaming live audio RTC Channel 5, and you will see this video, thank you, Scott, Yes. on RTC Channel 4 as well. And if you download the TuneIn Radio app, you can take us wherever you happen to be going. Woodlawn Hospital might be the agenda for today. Maybe we can do a little fishing out of the ponds, right, We've John? been seeing a lot of folks out there fishing. Yeah. I, uh, I was out there a couple weekends ago with my grandson. He's four. A uh, unique experience. Uh, 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 it lasted uh, longer than I thought. We didn't catch <laughs> anything, but his attention span did stay a little longer than I thought it was going to do. That's so excellent. We'll be doing it again, I, I hope, next visit. Maybe we'll actually catch a fish this time. <laughs> John Alley's president, CEO of Woodlawn Hospital, and he stops in once a month to talk with us about the Board of Trustees meeting. Had board meeting yesterday, and again, kind of a light agenda. Uh, as we get in this time of year, most of our projects are kind of in the between stages, nothing new going, and kind of winding a few things up. Did discuss the MRIs we talked about last month. We were replacing the, the older model we had with a new updated state-of-the-art MRI. That has all been installed. Most of the construction's done. Hopefully we start seeing patients in it by uh, late this week, mid next week. So they're going through today and, and updating the software and bringing the magnet up. And it was kind of unique when you talk to the physicist. Uh, I thought you throw a switch and the thing's ready to go. Not really. They got to bring it up really slow. They got to chill it. So there's a, a quite of a process to get that thing ready to see patients. So we'll bring in then the technicians next, and they'll train our staff on the different applications that this magnet does that our other one didn't. So really excited about it. It's uh, what called a wide bore short bore magnet. Okay. So it's you know if you're slightly claustrophobic, this should help a little bit. Our uh, last magnet, you could only go in one way, which was head first. So if we were doing a, a lower body scan, you had to go all the way into the magnet. This one allows us, you can go feet first or head first. So again, we're hoping that opens up that market. We've had some folks that I, I know of got in there and about 10 seconds in said, take me out. So we're hoping now with this one being a little bigger, a little wider and either feet or head first, They'll be able to stay in the area and not have to travel somewhere else to get their MRIs. Amazing how technology changes. It changes it. it uh, <laughs> you know, we, when we looked at this, it was do we buy it, do we lease it? And uh, the decision made, let's lease it because five years from now, when that lease is up, we're probably going to see just another leaps and bounds in technology. That allows us to very efficiently move that magnet out because we don't have a lot of capital invested in it. It still has a residual value at that point in time. So all we're really paying for is the time that we use it, not the life of the machine. So it's a wise way to go when you're looking at technology equipment that changes just about daily. What types of medical issues would go through that, John? Oh, it's uh, basically almost anything anymore. Okay. They've changed. Used to it was just kind of looking at, you know, if you were having some joint issues. Now the MRI technology has changed so much that they're using it for a, a lot of different scans now, and I think we are, this new magnet even has a uh, ability, instead of doing the old mammograms, now you can do an MRI, so it's less painful for the lady and gets greater detail. So I'm pretty sure that's one of going to be the new items that, uh, probably not right away, but it's one of the applications that's going to be uh, released fairly soon for that. So it, again, it's just every day something new comes out that you can use this technology for and the good thing about it it's not giving you radiation like a ct scan or an x-ray you know so we're not exposing you to a lot of radiation which is cumulative the more x-rays you have over time the more radiation is in your body so we're very conscious of that and try to do the very minimal we can as far as using radiation so if it can be done with an mri that's a smart way to do it by the way, if you have a question for John Alley, pick up the phone, give us a call, 223-6059. Other notes? Uh, still working on our dietary repair. Uh, we finally got to the point we had to do some underfloor drains, and of course to do that, you got to tear the floor out. So the uh, cafeteria's been closed. Hope to have it back open and operational uh, for the public July, I think, 6th, if that's a okay, Monday. It is. Uh, so I was back there just a little while ago, and it's coming along quite nicely. We've got ready to pour some concrete, fill the holes back in, so I think we're going to meet that timetable. It was just, you know, it's kind of nice that uh, we was able to find an off-site location to prepare the patient meals, and uh, so the staff's doing a super job. They're driving back and forth with a lot of food every day to make sure that the patients get the meals that they need. This is something that had to be done. Had to be done. It was one of those that's, uh, the longer we waited, the more expensive it was going to be and the worse the project, so uh, just got to the point that we knew we were having issues with some of the steam lines under the floor and some of the drains. Let's address it now before it got any worse. When it's all said and done, the cafeteria will look the same. It'll look the same. Most of all this work was actually done in the kitchen area, okay. in the food prep area. So it, it took as long, I think, to tape everything up that we couldn't move out. 
uh, we have to be very conscious of infection control. So you, you put barriers up to keep the dust and, and uh, any sediment that flies around when they're using, and they were back there using jackhammers, so there was a lot of stuff flying. <laughs> so yeah, they did a good job of making sure that once we get back in there, everything else is gonna be safe and ready to go. Okay. Got into the financials for May, and uh, May was a fairly busy month for us. Had gross revenue about 10.4 million. Uh, de our deductions was a little over six million, staying right in that you know 55 to 60 percent write-off uh, for whatever we bill. Still a little high. Still a little high, okay. and I think that's going to be the new norm as we're looking at uh, the higher deductible plans that are out there now. More folks have insurance, but they still have very very high deductibles, and it's very difficult for them to meet those. So we're still writing off a lot of the deductibles. Uh, had other operating revenue about 582 thousand. So it left us, uh, you know, dollars to work with 4.9 million. We had expenses for the month of about 4.3, so uh, about a $600,000 profit for the month of, of May. And again, very busy during May. June is kind of in between. We've, okay. we've been busy and then not so busy. So we're hoping again to try to break even for the month of June. And as we look through these summer months, that's usually when we kind of, you know, make up ground on those first three months of the year when we do lose money. So, uh, you know, fairly short board meeting, monitoring again. Got to keep a real close watch on our expenditures. And we looked at what our budget was compared to actual on a, a year to date. And we have a 0.9% difference between actual and what we projected. So the staff is doing an excellent job of predicting what our expenses are going to be. It's that revenue side that's hard because most of our expenses are fixed. We have to staff, whether we have one patient or 20, almost the same. So it's, it's a little difficult to... Uh, you know, vary on the expenses. That's the revenue side that really is the one we have to watch. And yet, it's important for Woodlawn to make a profit. Isn't we it? have to make a profit. Sure. You know, that's how it allows us to do with the MRI project as new technology comes up, be able to meet the needs of, of the physicians and the patients. Because you know, some of the when we go back 20 years ago, you know, if you come in for your appendix, you were there 15 days. Now you come in in the morning, you're gone in the afternoon. So you know, that's the type of things that has really changed over time that affects the delivery of healthcare. So, you know, we're not getting the large revenue we used to get from those long inpatient stays. Predominantly, everything we do now is an outpatient basis. Uh, you come in in the morning, you go home that night or that afternoon. So we have to change our thought, our philosophy, of how do we manage that and still keep those inpatient beds available for those patients that truly come in and are really sick and need a place to recover. And how do you manage it? And that? how do you manage it? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, you have to staff for it because sure. we don't know who's going to come in this afternoon. And I've seen uh, where I've come in in the morning, we might have nine beds uh, with patients in it upstairs. By the time I go home at five or six, we've got 22 patients. So it's, it's that volatile where all of a sudden you just have a ton of sick people come in and they have to be hospitalized. So you have to keep staff available because you don't know how the day's going to go. Talk with us a little bit about the emergency room and how that operates at Woodlawn Hospital. It, uh, you know, basically that's our front door to the community. We see a, a ton of people come through there and, uh, you know, a lot of them will come in thinking, oh, I just got the, a sore throat or, you know, my chest is hurting a little bit. All of a sudden we've got a major issue. So, you know, they do an excellent job of trying to determine what is really wrong with you. Uh, we, and we have a lot of folks come in that really could probably seek care elsewhere, but this is the only source they've got. They, they might not have a family physician or they just don't know where to go to get in immediately. So we see, you know, from the sore throats clear up to major trauma. Uh, staff 24-7, 365 days a year. Uh, we use a, a group of physicians that basically comes out of the Parkview system. Uh, so they do rotations through Parkview Hospital as well as Woodlawn. And what that allows us is they see a lot of those trauma major cases in, in Fort Wayne. So if they see it here, it's no big deal. They've already dealt with it. So we're able to keep a lot of the folks that we might have transferred 10 years ago, we're keeping those folks now because the physicians are used to seeing that and say, hey, this is no big deal. We can handle this here. It saves the family to drive to the Fort Wayne or South Bend. So it, it really is, a, like I say, it's the window to the hospital. That's usually everybody's first encounter, unfortunately, is through the ER of some sort. And then we determine what needs to be done there. And we have a very good group of physicians that knows our capabilities. And if they get a patient in, they say, you know, we really need to transfer this patient because it's what's best for them. I highly support that. You know, we've got to do what's best for that patient. And if it means to transfer them to Indianapolis, South Bend, or Fort Wayne, that's what we do. It, we can't sit on them and say, well, maybe we can do it here. I'd rather we say, no, let's get them to that tertiary care center where we know it's going to be something that maybe is outside our comfort zone because that's what's best for the patient. 
Any chance that Woodlawn would ever think about setting up a walk-in clinic in this area? We have looked at that and there's some demographics that, you know, there's a volume issue there. You've got to have a volume to be able to support that. And we've looked at it for about two years now. We just, when you look at the number of population we have, number of visits that it would take to do a minute clinic or whatever you want to call it, you know, the dock in the box, whatever you want to call those, we don't have enough volumes to support that. So what we're trying to do, can we partner that with something else that would help offset that cost so that at least it's a break even. Uh, right now we just don't have the enough volumes that would be what I call non-emergent to support that and we've tried to can we embed one within our ER itself then we get in other regulations and issues from a, a Medicare you know and Medicaid saying well you have to segregate those rooms you can only use them for that well there's days when we need them for really sick people too so it's a very complicated process we haven't given up on it. We're constantly saying, how can we put one in, partner it with another service that helps offset that cost so it can still be a benefit? Because we know there's a lot of people that are very conscious this is not an emergent condition, but it's nine o'clock on a Friday night. I've got a really bad sore throat. What do I do? We need to find that some way that we can help those folks so they're not having to drive you know, 30, 40 minutes to go to one of these walk-in clinics. John Alley's president and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital. Talk with us just a little bit, John, about, about the future of, let's say, county hospitals, about the future of maybe smaller hospitals that are not necessarily affiliated with a big city hospital. You know, that, what do that's you see that, there? That's the magic. I wish I had that crystal ball where you could look in and know what the future is going to be. But as we're looking <clears throat> as what's happening now and saying today is going to be a predictor of what's going to happen in the future, you know, unfortunately, I, I my philosophy is, and what I'm kind of looking at here is, 10, 15 years from now, I don't think there'll be any independent hospitals left in the United States. Because of the way the reimbursement's being designed, you're gonna to have to become a major uh, partner with another large facility. And is that good or bad? I don't right. know. I, I've seen some models that are now that has not worked where you know the large hospital will come in and buy the community hospital, and over time you just see more and more services siphoned off that you can't get in that local hospital. You have to drive you know, to the main hospital to get that. But I think that is gonna be the future of healthcare. And, and it's, it's 10, 12, 15 years away. We're seeing more and more of the independents starting that conversation now with somebody say, hey, when we get ready to make this move, are you interested and how can you help us? Um, we've talked about it at the board level. What are we gonna do? You know, it's, uh, we're 10 years away. I think we're, we've well positioned ourselves as being a critical access hospital there's a special reimbursement we get. Uh, it's cost plus 1%, cost plus 2%, you know, depends on which model. Someday that's gonna go away. And if we go back to what they call the PPS system, where it's, um, you know, you come in and if we diagnose you with pneumonia, we get a flat fee. If you're there one day or you're there 60 days, that's what we get. We're operating as if we're under that model, not a cost-based model. We're constantly trying to reduce our cost because if that cost base goes away, we wanna be ready. And there's a lot of hospitals that are just solely dependent on that cost base that if that program ceases, they will have to close or affiliate with somebody else. So we've been working toward that knowing someday this could go away. Let's operate as if we're not cost based, keep our costs down and move forward. And I think that's gonna position Woodlawn, you know, for a good 10, 12, 15 years. But past that, you know, I that's one of those where the board said, Can you guarantee me? No, nope, I can't. I, that's just kind of where I see healthcare going. Hospitals in a competitive situation? All hospitals are competitive okay. situation. You know, um, we're fairly lucky. We don't really have a hospital right next door to us. And, you know, we've got, uh, you know, Winnemac, we've got Plymouth, Kosciuszko, Peru, Logansport. They're just far enough away that we have a friendly competition with them. Yes, we compete for some of the same patients on a fringe basis. And you know that's where you just have to go services the, the thing there and, and customer service we all do the same thing it's just when you go somewhere how do you feel when you get there you know how do we make you feel and kind of that the more of the warm fuzzies and so it's become more of a hospitals become a retail business anymore uh, used to you know you went to your local hospital we're such a mobile society now that you're not regulated i can go anywhere for health care and I can be at a hospital 20 to 30 minutes from my home pretty well anywhere in the state of Indiana. So now we're in that more of that retail business and, and trying to not only treat you with the health care, but the other goes with it, customer service. And a good thing for Woodlawn, uh, one of 10 in the state with CMS. One of the 10 that, uh, again, we're working very hard to keep that. And uh, that's kind of a moving bar because 
as everybody gets better, they move that bar up so they don't leave it static. So even though we're getting, you know, maybe a fives and sixes on the scale now, they're going to say, okay, now we're going to raise that, and that five could become a three because they've raised that standard. Sure. So it's, we're constantly chasing to make sure we keep up with those demands that we're seeing from, you know, the federal government, even uh, Anthem Insurance. All the different insurance companies have their own quality programs, and we're held accountable to meet those standards that they're putting forth. It would be nice if they were all the same standard, but they're not. So if we got 12 different insurance companies, we have 12 different quality standards we have to meet. So it's very difficult to kind of keep all those in line and, and uh, move forward. Finally, John, good golf tournament? Good golf tournament. Yep. Uh, you know, I was in charge of the weather. I was and you told. did well. I did well. I warned them. I said, past 4 <laughs> o'clock, we're going to have a problem. And I think about 4.30, the big storm <laughs> rolled through. And there was a few folks, I think, were caught out on the backside of the golf course, and they got a free shower uh -huh. out of that. We didn't charge them extra for the shower. That was nice. It, of was, it was all free. <laughs> Looked like a big day, though, for it the was Woodlawn a big Foundation. Day. Yes. Uh, and the uh, teams just have fun. We try to make sure that that's a fun golf tournament. Everybody I talked to, I tried to talk to them, all the teams that come through, and uh, everybody said they were having a good time and, and enjoyed themselves. Going to do it again next year. Going to do it again next year. Absolutely. Yes. John Alley, President and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital. Have we pretty well covered it? The only other thing we got coming up here, I want to remind folks, July 4th is coming up. Be careful with your fireworks. You know, just be careful. We don't want to see you in the ER with you know, burns or other injuries. Exactly. So just use some common sense and, you know, if you're getting those those major boomers, let the professionals do that. Try not to do those in your backyard. One, you could get hurt, and two, it irritates the neighbors. Keep them up at night. <laughs> and if not the neighbors, it irritates the neighbor's dog. That's yes. Sure. <laughs> John Alley, thanks very much. We Thank appreciate you. your time. Scott Sager with RTC TV. Today on Talk Talk, we have nurse practitioner Kelsey Heckeman. Kelsey's here to talk a little bit about colon screenings, the importance of it, the how to's, and the why's. Kelsey, thanks for coming today. Why don't you take a moment and introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Kelsey Heckeman. I am a nurse practitioner at Woodlawn Medical Clinics. I'm a family, I specialize in family practice. Um, my clinic's actually located in the hospital, but again, that's still just a clinic. I still just do the family medicine there. I work um, in collaboration with Dr. Salt. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about colon cancer screening and why it's important. Um, colon cancer is the third most common cancer in the U.S. and the second deadliest after lung cancer. So obviously for obvious reasons, colon cancer screening is very important. Um, there, I'll talk to you about some of the symptoms of colon cancer. There are some common symptoms would be blood in the stool, some generalized abdominal pain, um, change in bowel movements, all of a sudden you're having constipation or diarrhea, changes in diameter of stool, um, but it's also important to remember that many patients have absolutely no symptoms, so screening is still very important. So most colon cancers start out as a polyp. Um, polyps are removed very easily during a routine colonoscopy. That polyp is then sent off to the lab for pathology and determined if it's just benign, just basically like a benign mole, or is this a premalignant cancer growing? If it is premalignant, sometimes that would require more routine colonoscopies. Sometimes it requires some treatment, it just depends on what it would show. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about some of the screenings that are available right now. There's three main screenings. Um, one, maybe you're, you may or may not have heard of this, is fecal occult blood testing. This is where the patient is given a card. Um, they're given three cards and they actually do this on their own. So they take the card home and they take a stool specimen and wipe it on that card on day one. They do the same thing day two and day three. You then bring those cards back into your provider's office and those cards are checked to see if there's any blood in them. And a lot of times blood could be a big indicator that there may be a colon cancer in there somewhere or if not colon cancer polyps. Um, so if those were to show that there's positive blood, your next step would be a colonoscopy. 
uh, another option that's available, which is not usually routinely done, but it is, it is there. It's there for you to have that discussion with your provider about is a sigmoidoscopy. That is where they go in, and it's similar to a colonoscopy. However, they can only check the distal end of the colon, so we're not getting the full um, spectrum of the colon, checking for the whole entire thing. We're just checking that distal end, which is typically where most cancers are, but not always. Very, very often they're also in the anterior section, which is not seen on a sigmoidoscopy. Uh, sigmoidoscopy still would require bowel prep the night before. It is not, you do not have to be put under. You're, you will be able to drive home that same day on your own. Um, but again, it's just not as common nowadays and a lot of providers are opting out of doing those. Obviously, goal, colonoscopies are the gold standard for colon cancer screening. Um, colono, colonoscopies get the full picture of the colon. At that time, if there's any polyps seen, the, the provider is able to remove those polyps, send them out. Um, colonoscopies are done every 10 years, as long as everything's okay. Um, if there's if there's polyps or suspicious lesions, or you're having any uh, symptoms, you know sometimes they might. It, that's a discussion between you and your provider, but sometimes they might need to be done more frequently. Well, that's some great information, Kelsey. Tell me, let's talk a little bit about age. At what age should I start coming in for these screenings? Typically, and again, this is this discussion you need to be having with your provider. If you are having no symptoms, your bowels are normal, you have no family history, we start screenings at age 50. Now, if you have a family history, a first degree relative, we usually will start at age 40 or um, 10 years for that youngest relative. So if the, that relative, your mother, had colon cancer at age 42, we would start screening you at age 32. So you definitely need to be letting your provider know if you have any colon cancer that runs in the family. Usually, again, we, we mainly look at your immediate family members, but it's also important to let them know, did grandparents, did aunts, did uncles have colon cancer? So it still might, it might be uh, better for you to start at a younger age at that time. So again, age 50 is when we start colon cancer screenings, but if you are coming in at age 35, 38, and you're having blood in your stool, you're having abdominal pain, you're having changes in your bowel movements, that might warrant a colonoscopy much sooner. So if you are having symptoms, you know, attend, sometimes we do need to start those at a younger age. Um, so, and then there's also patients who have the inflammatory bowel conditions, things like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. Not very common, but there are those out there that have those, and sometimes those will require colonoscopies every one to two years, just because you're at a much higher increased risk for cancer. Uh, typically, and this is again a discussion you need to have with your provider, but guidelines say around age 75 is when we can stop doing colon cancer screenings. If you're a very healthy 75-year-old, you have hardly any comorbidities, you know, 85 might be a better age for you. It just depends and that's a, an open discussion you and your provider need to have together. Um, briefly touch on some new technologies that are coming. Not quite there yet but they might be great benefit for us in the future is a CT colonography, colonography excuse me, uh, basically like an advanced x-ray. It would still require a bowel prep the night before. However, you basically go in, you lay on a table, they scan your colon, and it really gives us a detailed image of the inside of your colon if there's any polyps or cancers growing. So it would not be invasive. Um, another one is the, the pill cam. You take a pill, it's a camera, you swallow it, you collect it out of your stool the next day and you take it into your provider and they, they watch the image as it goes through your colon. So that's pretty neat. Um, and then there's also something coming out called fecal DNA testing. Um, not quite common yet, but we are seeing it come on the market where you would take your, a stool specimen, we'd send it off to a lab and they analyze your stool for any DNA evidence of colon cancer. So uh, again, you know, if, if you're 50, around age 50, 55, 60, you haven't had your colonoscopy, you really need to think about getting in with your provider and talking about that. It's extremely important. It saves lives every day. Um, and again, it, it's one day of your life. Okay, Kelsey. It's not the best subject in the world, but I've got some questions for you. The first of which, in talking about bowel prep, what really does that entail? Well, the bowel prep is something, it's a prescription that you'll pick up at the pharmacy. Um, typically, it's about a liter of fluid. However, nowadays, they've got some 
uh, more advanced ver versions where it's just basically two or three Gatorade bottles full. And it's basically Miralax and it flushes your system out and cleans it out so that the doctor is able to get a very clear picture of your colon when he goes in for that colonoscopy. If there's stool still in the colon, you know, that doesn't get us a good picture of, of the wall of the colon. Um, so it requires, you know, that evening around five to seven o'clock, you would start that bowel prep and you would end up having frequent bowel movements throughout the night. Um, by the morning time, you are completely cleaned out and you're ready to go. Okay. Well, again, some valuable information there, Kelsey. Tell us one more time, how do we find out more information about uh, colon screenings at Woodlawn Hospital? Um, please feel free to call us uh, at the hospital, number is 223-2020 with any questions, concerns. Uh, great talking with you guys and let me know if you have any questions. This has been Doc Talk on RTC TV. I'm Scott Sager, been joined today by my guest Kelsey Heckman talking about colon screenings out at Woodlawn Hospital. As always, if you have any questions, health concerns, please talk to your Woodlawn healthcare provider. They're happy to help and they want to make sure that your health is the most important thing. Again, Scott Sager with RTC TV. Thanks for tuning in to Doc Talk.